Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. Uh, today, I'm excited to have Michael Becker on the show. Thanks for being on the show, Michael. Hey, thanks for having me. And Michael uh, is a principal at SPI Advisory. He heads the SPI's Dallas office. Um, they specialize in repositioning multifamily assets. He's, he's a 15-year veteran of commercial finance banker. Um, he controls over th many thousands of units, and he's done this in a very short period of time. So I'm excited to, to hear Michael talk about how he, he went from no units to many thousands of units, how he's built his team, and uh, he's going to help us do the same thing. And uh, thanks a lot, Michael. And would you start just by telling us a little bit about your background and how you got into multifamily syndication? Yeah, so as you mentioned, uh, I'm a longtime banker. That's kind of what I did for a profession. Uh, so what I what I focused on when I was a, a lender, I, I did income producing real estate. So I did all the major uh, food groups. I did office, industrial, retail. In the last five or six years, of my my banking tenure, I focused only on value add multifamily uh, lending. So I, I worked for a community bank, and then my bank got got bought by Wells Fargo in 2008. So I spent my last five or six years there. And I kind of built a program out for, for them. And through that process, kind of realized I was on the, the wrong side of all these deals. It's kind of better be the, the borrower than the lender. You know, I was out there making a, a good living, but I was watching a lot of my clients get rich. And I, I felt like I knew as much or more about it than most of my clients. So about um, about five years ago, or really about seven or eight years ago, I started doing some single family stuff, kind of my own account. Then about five years ago, I realized that wasn't very scalable. So in the last five years, we're, we're just about to close on our 30th deal. It'll be um, about 62, a little bit over 6,200 units uh, in the Dallas Fort Worth area. And then now we're in, we have a couple of deals down in the Austin market. And that's really, uh, that's really kind of my, my brief story of, uh, of what we've done. So, so you were financing to many multifamily syndicators. You were, you felt like you knew as much about the business as they did, but, but you started to a single family. Why, how come the single family? Uh, really that with, with the benefit of hindsight that, um, that wasn't necessary, but it was just something where I was kind of coming out of the recession and then realized, you know, a lot of the deals that had problems had partnerships and I, and I didn't really want to, uh, to kind of get into that at that point in time. So I really just kind of focused on these little deals and I'd put 15, 20,000 bucks in each house and none of these little houses would bankrupt me. Uh, you know, buying a hundred thousand dollar rent house wouldn't, wouldn't bankrupt me. Um, and it really what that did, it did give me kind of project management, um, uh, training and help me kind of get comfortable with, the, with some of the real estate, but really wasn't necessary and through that process. This just wasn't very scalable. I was, I was, you know, I did 16, I think before I kind of quit and sold them all and, uh, and transitioned over to multifamily, but it, it was, I mean, it was a good learning experience. I just don't think with my background, I necessarily needed it. I could have went run into the, uh, to the multifamily. Hmm. So you didn't want partnerships. Um, so when did that change and why did that change? Yeah, it was just it was just like like I mentioned, this wasn't very scalable what I was doing. So um, looking around, like I, uh, all my clients, I mean, you just have to syndicate. You have to raise capital from others to be able to get uh, these larger deals put together. Because unless you're just independently wealthy, which which you know, I like I said I did okay for myself. I had a nice living, but I certainly didn't have millions upon millions in the bank. I think to date we raised over 150 million dollars from other people. So we just, I just, you can't do that without pooling resources of others. So that that's really why I made the transition over it was because I wanted some scalability. I wanted to do this professionally. I wanted to stop being a banker. So the only way I, I knew how to do that was to, to transition over to the syndicated, um, to be a, an apartment syndicator essentially. So you were in the single family business. You decided, okay, we're going to, we're going to go, we're going to scale. We're going to do multifamily. So how did you find the first deal? First multifamily deal? Uh, so, so when I was a banker, I made a, a couple loans um, to to some clients out of Los Angeles, and uh, I flew out to meet them, and that's how I met my now business partner. So, my, my business partner Sean, who's based in Austin, I'm based in Dallas, and he was working for a broker out of Beverly Hills at the time that would help high net worth individuals um, put deals together and, and buy them in, in, in Texas. And I made a loan to one of their clients. And so really the first deal that we did, he, he found it, um, it was in 2013. So it was a little bit more, uh, a little bit less of a difficult environment if you're a purchaser of multifamily than is, you know, five years later today. And so we were able to find the deal off market. It was through a, a connection that he had done a couple of deals with, um, 
at, at hit for his, uh, his employer. So we ended up uh, getting one high net worth individual that put uh, about 95% of the money in. We put about 5% of the money in. That's kind of how we got the deal done. Uh, the first time it was a, a 120 unit uh, deal. I think we paid about 3.8, 3.9 million for it. Uh, and we owned it for about two years and sold it for like six and a half million. So it was a, it was a pretty nice uh, little quick in and out deal. Wow. That is really nice. So uh, what was your, your partner's background? Did he have a background in real estate? Yeah. So he was, he was a financial analyst and then he, he was working for, like I said, the broker out of Beverly Hills and all he did all day was underwrite and analyze deals and run escrows. So he basically just kind of did buyer representation essentially. And so his background and my background, and we kind of, you know, had uh, complementary skill sets. He's uh, not, not that I'm not analytical, but he's extremely analytical and is really good at that. And I, I had a lot of relationships here locally being in the, a vendor in the business. I knew everybody. I knew all the brokers, all the brokers knew me, what I really needed was kind of transition myself from being a, a vendor in the business to being a principal. And that's kind of really what I, what I, my, my struggle was when I was starting out. Uh, fortunately, the environment was a little bit easier at the time I was doing it than, uh, than what it is today. So we were able to, I think that I did four deals in my first six months for about 800 units, just kind of one after another, after another, using a lot of capital that, that he had from California before we really started transitioning and doing larger syndications like, like what we do today. Wow. So you all became very comfortable, very quick. It sounds you, you say four deals in six months. Yeah. Four deals, six months, about 800 units. Wow. And so we, we, that was, I mean, that was, the, that just shows the connections that you already had and that your partner had were critical, right? I mean, you already built these relationships and they, they really helped you to just catapult your business. That's right. Yeah. It's uh, one of the things I like to say, it's a completely unfair business. It's uh, it's what you know, it's who you know, it's what connections you have, which favors you can trade, which your history is with them. So a lot of that, a lot of that was in play from the, from the start. So I had a lot of that and, and a lot of people that, that start out obviously don't have that, but uh, just because you don't have it, you know, everyone starts with what they have and what resources they have. Right. And then you just got to position yourself to go in and, and uh, find what you need through, through, you know, strategic partnerships, through, you know, business through the management company, through mortgage brokers, all these little pieces of the puzzle you got to put together. So I had, I had some relationships. I had some, you know, experience by, by being you know, involved in the business, by loaning on it. What I really needed was kind of money and to get the credibility as a principal in the business. And so I kind of, that's what I really, what I focused on out of the gate. So like I said, I did the first four deals. I took a pretty small split. You know, I think we could basically put 5% of the money in to get 10% of the ownership. So it was a pretty, pretty small equity split, but really what I was focused on was just getting scale out of the gate so I can then, you know, get our track record, get a, get a, get myself positioned in the marketplace so I can leave the bank and, and do this full time. Well, it was definitely worthwhile to be at 6,200 units now, right? That's right. That's right. So could you elaborate on the strategic partnerships? Now you, you talked about that a little bit, but how does someone say that they don't have the financing or banking background? Uh, what are some ways we can develop those partnerships or, or meet those individuals? Yeah. So like, like I said, it really just got to be, self-aware and kind of analyze what what do you bring to the table and then and then find your deficiencies and kind of work work to solve those so if you're just uh you know a high paid you know say engineer or salesperson or something some along those lines make a couple hundred grand a year you have a little bit of money in the bank so you need to basically find deals and find money that's kind of the, the two highest uses of your time being in a, a syndicator in commercial real estate. So to find, to find money, you got to go to, you know, uh, your first and, First place most people look is kind of friends and family. Uh, you know, the saying is kind of for the first people to give you money, your friends, family, and fools. So people that, you know, know you or and don't know any better that you don't know what you're doing when you're starting out. So uh, so that's kind of the first place. But that's only so deep. And then you need to kind of get 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 out there and meet new people that are interested in, in you know, in real estate investing. So the first place I would suggest it's a lot of local um, meetups, a lot of local mentoring uh, groups, some national ones. Uh, depending on where you're at, if you're in any city of any sort of size, or there's plenty of them around. So that's kind of a place I would certainly recommend these people go. There's also, if you go and you can get with a reputable group, you can also get a baseline of education that, that you, you know, this business isn't overly complicated. It's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward, but you don't know what you don't know. So getting that base level education is certainly something I'm a big um, proponent of. So I'd go to a reputable group, get the basic level education. And then when, when you're within the group, there's a bunch of life like-minded people that already believe in commercial real estate, already believe in multifamily, if that's what you're doing, your office or industrial or whatever, whatever your asset class you're going to focus on. Uh, but multifamily, 
And so you don't have to sell them on why real estate, why multifamily, you just got to really sell them on why you and why, why this deal. Um, so that's kind of really the first place I would do if you are new into it, you know, one of your biggest team members certainly would be the management company that you're going to hire most likely to, to manage the deal, trying to self manage these large deals. And particularly if you have a job, that's uh, typically not the best idea in, in my experience. So getting, a good competent uh, management company that manages the types of deal that you're going to, you're going to own in the areas that you're going to own it in. There's usually a handful of management companies that kind of specialize in a class C apartments and suburban Dallas, for example. So there's, you know, four or five, six of them that are kind of the, the biggest ones here in, in our market. If you go to a smaller market, maybe you have one or two in that market. So kind of getting married up with them. And then on the financing side, make sure you have a good competent commercial mortgage broker to help you kind of navigate the, uh, the, the financing part of it. And then uh, once you kind of get your team and track record or your team kind of set up, you know, how do you, how do you go get the deal that that's obviously um, a little bit more of a challenge in today's environment where it wasn't necessarily that uh, it was kind of the opposite of it. When I started that the money was harder to find than the deal. Um, it was very competitive in all the major spaces in particular in multifamily, but all the major asset classes are pretty competitive. From what I understand. So, you know, the brokers control most of these deals. So, you know, going to the broker and kind of laying out, you know, Hey, I, I might not have done this before, but you know, so-and-so is my management company, which is a management company that the broker should know of. If you, if you do what I just talked about, um, you know, so-and-so is my mortgage broker. So we pick a successful mortgage broker. He's vetted me. We got the team set up, you know, I have enough money for the pursuit costs. And then here's my, my equity investor pool that I'm going to go raise the capital from. So you're kind of solving some pieces of the puzzle for the broker because because the broker's job you know uh, obviously people think he, that the broker needs to get the highest price for his client um, but also their, their job to assess the credibility of any potential buyer they're going to bring in so for you having these kind of um, thought out positions where like I have my debt lined up have my equity lined up this is how I'm going to manage it you know you kind of start taking some of those questions out that the broker um, need to be able to answer for his client. That's some great advice. Uh, I haven't heard it worded like that about solving problems for the broker before you even develop that relationship. Uh, that just shows your credibility also, or just that you're more prepared also, you know, when you go to have that conversation, I'm sure. Um, you know, what would you tell your, your 18 year old self, you know, looking back now, what, what would you tell, you know, before you really developed your professional career in banking, uh, what, what would you tell, tell yourself if you could go back at 18? You know, uh, I, uh, I, I, like everyone says, I, I think I bought my first income property at 31 or two. I'll be, I'll be 40 here in a, in a week. So uh, I think I was like 31 or two when I, when I bought my first uh, income property. So I probably would have started a little bit earlier, but you know, I think, I don't think I made any major mistakes along the way. Um, you know, I, I was uh, a professional working, you know, working hard. I was in a position where I can earn some commission. I was very successful at, at, at being a banker. I led, led my business unit three years in a row for the nation. Um, and when I worked at Wells Fargo for loan production. So what I did was I kind of, I sacrificed a little below my means. I accumulated some capital. And then once I got that done, then I had some you know money to then start putting towards these deals. Um, you know, so I don't think I made any major mistakes. I, I certainly could have got started a little quicker and I currently certainly could have quitted or skipped, um, the single family space went right into the multifamily. But I think if, if you're 18 and you can get a base level education, uh, especially if you have some interest in the, in the real estate space, you know, I went to college and I don't think I use anything that I got from college, uh, and, in my day to day work, maybe some of the accounting stuff I, uh, is helpful along the way when it comes to tax season, but, um, you know, making sure that, that you get a base level education, making sure you go into these events, make sure you get networks. Um, you know, people, you know, one of the things I like to say is no one ever comes to my house, my office to give me money or a deal. So you got to go out and get it. So you got to go to the places where the brokers are, uh, and you got to go to events where, where potential investors are. So, you know, this is not a business you can do behind your, behind your computer. You got to go out and kind of press the flesh and, and then, uh, you know, that's how relationships are formed. Awesome. Awesome. You, you had recently talked about money being harder to find uh, than the deal maybe, you know, at one time, but now that's changed. Uh, can you elaborate, elaborate on that? Yeah. You know, when, when, it, when the best deals are out there, everyone's, everyone's scared. So, uh, or they're having problems, whatever else they're investing in. So they tend to, uh, you know, be a little bit harder to raise the capital when, when we're in economic contraction. And right now the world's awash with money I and mean, the government's, you know, the federal reserve is printing, you know, 
trillions upon trillions of dollars every year to to do it. So it seems like everyone has money, and uh, they're all chasing, you know, trying to find stuff that makes sense. So you know, commercial real estate has certainly been one of the uh, most favorite asset classes, and in particular. Apartments have been the darling of the commercial real estate space for, you know, really, you know, many, many years for, for many, many good reasons. And so, you know, there's a lot of capital chasing these deals. So the cap rates certainly have compressed quite a bit over the last, uh, you know, five, six years, really, really, you know, from, from kind of where we started to where we are today. I mean, it's probably probably two, 300 basis points in cap rate compression, especially in like kind of the workforce housing, the BNC space. So, you know, that's really just driving the pricing up on these deals. It's been pretty competitive. It does feel like that's kind of shifting a little bit. It's kind of real time. We're in kind of early September as we, uh, 2018, as we record this. And it feels like that's kind of shifting a little bit right now. There's a little bit where the buyer pool is a little bit more shallow than it was a year ago. So I think there's kind of this, this point of resistance where, where, you know, the treasury 10 year treasury rates kind of ticked up that drives mortgage rates kind of ticking up. So the, uh, so the spread between the interest rate and the cap rate have certainly um, uh, narrowed to where it was very thin at this point. So I think some of the buyers are finally kind of pushing back on, on some of the sellers pricing ex- expectations. So I do, it does kind of feel like that, that might be kind of um, changing. I'm not saying that we're, we're completely switched and we're going to have some sort of recession or pricing can kind of drop. It just seems like we're, we might not have quite the same volume just because of the disconnect and pricing expectations from the sellers to what the buyers are willing to pay. And it might take a little bit of time for some price discovery to happen in the marketplace and uh, might see a little bit lower transaction volume due to that. Um, but overall, it seems like it's pretty healthy out there from fundamental standpoints. And, you know, the, the from compared to say, 12, 13 years ago, the lending standards today are still really, um, really tight. They're really in line. You know, there's not a bunch of BS going on like there was in, you know, 05, 06, when, when they're putting all these bad loans on. The loans are pretty tight. So whatever the next uh, recession that's going to drive the apartment uh, market, I don't think it's going to be a lender-driven event like it was uh, like it was 10, 12 years ago. Mm. You briefly mentioned like cap rates, uh, basis points, uh, and just for for listeners that are just getting into the business, and we could we'll have whole shows on these on these specific topics. But could you just give us a brief satellite image view of of those terms? Yeah. So what a what a cap rate is is essentially um, if you were to buy a property with cash, what what's your you know all your you, you take all your operating um, income your rent, your other income, your late fees, things like that. And then you, you subtract out all your operating expenses. So, you know, rent and, I'm sorry, payroll and uh, utilities and property taxes and repairs and maintenance, all that. So you've got your operating income minus your, your operating expenses. It gets you your debt operating income. So your NOI, that excludes like your, your debt service or just for capital events. So so basically um, that, that's kind of how these commercial real estate deals are valued is based off your NOI divided by a cap rate or capitalization rate. So if, um, for example, if if I were to buy a property for a million dollars that produced a hundred thousand dollar net operating income, that's a 10 cap or 10% capitalization rate. So basically you just divide a hundred thousand by 0.1 that equal a million. So if that was a five cap, you for that same hundred thousand dollars in, in NOI, you'd pay $2 million for it. So that kind of goes, goes up and down. Um, so that, that's really how all these is kind of taking different properties and trying to compare them uh, at one metric, uh, kind of compare two different assets uh, to, to, to each other. Um, and then uh, on, on the interest rate, uh, you know, every every one percentage point is 100 basis points. So, you know, if you have one percent is, is 100 basis points or 0.5% uh, is 50 basis points or BIPs is what we call it. So, uh, you know, really what, what you want to try to uh, have happen if, if uh, the goal is to try to have your cap rate, you know, higher than what the, the cost of your debt is, your interest rate, and then you know, the difference between the two is, is what we call arbitrage. So you get, you know, the higher the cap rate, the more and the lower the interest rate, the difference between those two, the more yield you produce along the way. Um, that's real kind of high level. There's a lot of nuances to that. But that's kind of real high level what those two things mean. That's great. Uh, you know, you had talked about like buyer pool being more shallow now, low, lower uh, transaction volume. And uh, could you tell us, you know, what is SPI doing differently now, you know, to, to find deals and maybe analyze deals that, that you were, you know, say four years ago? 
Uh, the same, same, uh, we're still doing basically the same thing that we've done the entire time, which is kind of like a light value add. So what we're, we're targeting properties that are you know, pretty well located that are, you know, 10% or more, or more below market uh, rents compared to the competitor properties down the street that, you know, typically those types of deals either have a physical issue or management issue or some combination of those two things become these deals pretty well capitalized, cure any sort of deferred maintenance on the property. And with the money we set aside up front, we can implement our upgrade or value add strategy. So we'll upgrade the kind of like the common area stuff, like the office or the pool area or fitness center, some along those lines, then we'll go into the units and typically they'll have either white or almond appliances and gold and brass light and plumbing fixtures. And we'll kind of you know, swap that out to black appliances or stainless or and brush nickel fixtures and upgrade the flooring and cabinetry and things along those lines. And through those efforts, we're able to kind of come in and increase the value. So we're pretty much do the same thing. What's kind of different really is when we first started, you know, really, we focus on class C multifamily. So in Texas, that's really 1960s, 1970s kind of vintage. And then uh, about three or so years ago, we transitioned over into the B class, which is really 1980s. And then now what we focus on, um, you know, it's kind of B to A minus what I call it. It's really my favorite part of the market and what the most uh, abundance of the most recent deals we've done have been kind of like that two, the late 90s to 2008, kind of pre-recession 2000s. So really 2000, 2008 is kind of really what, what I think is the best part of the market right now. Um, and so that that's that's one thing that we've kind of shifted to the reason because we've been doing that is because um, the cap rates uh, have, have kind of uh, compressed. So uh, what, I, what I've been saying kind of recently, if you go back about about five years ago, and we'll use Dallas as an example because that's the market that I live in. Um, you can buy a brand new Class A deal in Dallas for about five years ago for about a five cap. You buy a B deal for about six and a half. You can buy a C deal for like uh, eight to eight and a half. Um, if you go forward to today, a brand new Class A deal in Dallas is about a four and a half. A B deal is about a five, and a C is about five and a half. So that spread used to be 300, 350 basis points, you know, three and a half percent between the top of the top of the grade to the bottom of the grade. And now that's 1% or hundred basis points or less. So it doesn't make as much sense on a risk adjusted return basis to, for me to go pay a very similar cap rate for an older building that it would a newer building. So we're kind of focusing on that a little bit more. Uh, and also we have a track record, you know, we've done, we're about to close our 30th acquisition. We've also sold uh, 12 and done two, you know, we've gone full cycle on 14 deals. We sold 12, we've done two full cash out refis. We have another deal in escrow to sell that'll close uh, in October of this year. So, you know, we have ability to track more capital than what we did when we first started with no track record. So to, to place that, you need to buy a little bigger deals. Um, the other thing that we're doing to kind of kind of zig where the people are zagging is is the last say you know 18 20 months we're pretty much exclusively focused on uh properties that we could come in and, and do a loan assumption so a very key distinction between the multifamily space or commercial real estate and uh and the single family space is these loans that you put on them have uh, t sometimes tend to have very large prepayment penalties, so called either yield maintenance or defeasance. Uh, so you can Google those two terms. So basically it's a formula that, that produces, you know, uh, a very large prepayment penalty and that penalty kind of shrinks as the closer you get to maturity or if your note rate is, is below what the current market rates are, that can that can have your, your prepayment go down or up depending on how that, that is relative to current market rates. Um, and the loans that, that we put on, uh, these are, you know, predominantly uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are also not only the two largest lenders in the single family space so the two largest lenders in the multifamily space as well so most of these loans are either Fannie or Freddie Mac loan and all these loans are assumable so I could come in uh, put a loan on it I could sell it the next buyer can come in and assume that mortgage um, they also allow what's for what's called supplemental financing as well so they'll allow um, you know, not only take over the mortgage, but they'll allow you if, if the property qualifies some the economics of it, to put a second mortgage on it that, that kind of releverages loans up to 70 or 75% to what the, uh, the current market value of it is. Um, there's a lot of nuances within that, but basically the, the point is, is, is we're coming in and assuming some of these mortgages where the seller can avoid paying this big prepayment penalty and they can pass that price on as uh, that savings as in, in to us as a lower sales price because because if they had to sell it you know for what's called free and clear pay off their mortgage they would t 
have to absorb a very large prepayment penalty. So we tend to get a little bit of a, a cost basis break by doing these loan assumptions and we're able to come in, you know, own it for a few years, let that prepayment burn down, and then, you know, either sell it or refinance it. So that's really kind of one thing that we've been doing. And the buyer pool is a little bit smaller even on loan assumption deals than they are on these, these kind of free, all cash or free and clear deals. Because what, two, three years ago you put on, you're getting one, maybe three years of interest only on some of these loans that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac put out today, getting five, six, seven years are very common of interest only. So it really juices the yield to a potential buyer if you can get six or seven years of interest only relative to having an amortizing loan that you have to take over. So those, those are some of the things that we've been kind of doing both moving up in property grade a little bit to kind of the top end of the workforce housing to the kind of the A minus space, as well as uh, looking for loan assumptions. So we get a little better cost basis. Wow. Thank you for explaining that. That was, that was great. And you know, before we have to go, could you tell us um, like the, you know, so many people in this industry, you, you've seen so many properties and transactions now. What, what's the top reason that most syndicators fail? Fail, um, you know, really there's uh, kind of going back to the last cycle, you know, 10 years ago, I was, I was a banker. I was kind of the grim reaper about this time, 10 years ago, taking, uh, taking all these properties back and having to work these loans out. Uh, there's really four, there's four things I, I kind of observe that if you do four things, uh, uh, the correct way, I think that's about 90, 99, 90 or 95% of the risk in these deals. So, you know, first and foremost, uh, I saw people get in trouble because, you know, one, they bought in a high crime area, they bought in the hood, right? So rule number one is don't buy in the hood. So if you buy in these high crime, low, uh, you know, lower socioeconomic areas, with a lot of, you know, like I said, crime and stuff, uh, people that live there tend to live there because they have to, because um, they don't have better options. And so right now, everything's, everything and everywhere is full, like our, you know, Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, all the major cities across the area even the bad properties are full because there's such demand to it but uh you know whenever we hit a recession i think those are going to be the areas that are most likely to, to feel it um from these tenants just don't have any money set aside so one little blip in their life is gonna you know allow them to not be able to pay rent to you on a monthly basis and kind of you have a lot of skips and evictions and collection loss and things like that so that's that's number one don't buy in the hood number two these, these people came in these deals and had you know improper management so, uh, for example, we had a loan that, that one of my colleagues made that I inherited that uh, literally they, they made a loan where a UPS driver from Los Angeles sold like some single family house, had half a million dollars or something in 1031 exchange, and bought an apartment complex in, in Texas, and uh, he tried to self-manage it from California. So, you know, nothing wrong with being a UPS driver, but you don't tend to have property management experience and background, so you kind of see how the end of that story went. So, you know, he just mismanaged this thing completely. Uh, and so if you have proper management company that manages these types of deals that have a track record in tenure, they know how to deal with the tenants in the city and apply with all the, the, the laws of the area, that's certainly, um, you know, a good way to mitigate a lot of the risks. The third reason is, you know, these people came in these deals undercapitalized. So they, they didn't do a good thorough inspection. They didn't set aside enough money up front to cure all the deferred maintenance and set aside enough money up front to implement their 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 business plan, you know, with this value add strategy. So these thought they could do out of cash flow. So if you come to these deals undercapitalized, you know, kind of uh, what happens, what, what kind of like the analogy I like to use if say like you're in Texas like I am, make it's hot here in the summertime and you have an AC go out on an occupied unit and you don't have enough money, you don't have a thousand dollars to go fix the ac condenser what they'll do is they'll take a condenser from a from a vacant unit put it on the occupied unit now you have a non-leasable unit and it kind of snowballs a snowball so make sure you set aside enough money up front to do it and then finally uh, a lot of people that that did the other things right they just didn't have they just happen to have a loan maturity at a bad time Right. So these people come in these short term bridge loans. And if you happen to have a loan maturity in 2009, for example, when the capital markets were frozen, um, your property, you know, your property is temporarily depressed in value because, uh, you know, there's very little transactions. Cap rates went up. But, you know, you're able to cash flow if, if, if you didn't have a loan maturity. Um, the, the banker's playbook is, though, make you remargin their loan. So to extend your loan, they'll make you, you know, they'll get a new appraisal. And if you had an 80 percent loan to value, now it's 90 percent loan to value or 100 percent loan to value going to say, come pay down my mortgage, get me back to 80% to the new value. And the, the, the lead on the deal, he's asked to put that money up themselves or go to all their partners and say, hey, I need more capital to reinvest. And they're just getting crushed in the stock market. And they're like, I'm not giving you more money. And then they're forced to, you know, sell the deal at a bad time. Those are, those are it. So 
buying the better located areas, make sure you have capital set aside up front, have proper management in place, and try to take out a loan that's you know multiple years past what your, your expected business uh, plan is gonna be. You do those kind of four things, that's probably 95% of the risk of, of these deals. Awesome, that's incredible. Um, Michael, uh, tell us, tell the listener how they can get in touch with you and learn more about SBI. Yeah, really, it's, there's two ways uh, that people can find me. So first and foremost, I host a podcast. Uh, so if you listen to me on this one, you can certainly find ours. It's called the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast, so Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast. So go to oldcapitalpodcast.com. That's our website. But it's on iTunes, Stitcher, or pretty much anywhere you listen to me uh, on this podcast, you should be able to find ours. So I certainly appreciate people subscribe to that. We do a weekly um, interview. Old Capital is a, is a commercial mortgage broker that I'm so affiliated with. I don't really do that anymore, but my partner Paul. Um, Paul and I host a, uh, a podcast here. We could have at least a weekly episode. And then the other way, uh, other way to find me is to simply go to my company's website, which is www.spiadvisory.com. That's SPI, like spy, advisory.com. There, there's a contact us form. And uh, if you fill that out, I'm always happy to have a 10 or 15 minute telephone call. With people, I meet off the podcast. Thank you so much, Michael. And I hope everyone will listen to the Old Capital Podcast. I've been listening to it for a long time and I cannot recommend it high enough. I've learned a lot and just the questions that are asked of Michael and he gives great answers and very clear and precise things that you can apply to your, your business today. Uh, thanks again, Michael, for being on the show and we will talk to everyone tomorrow. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.